Grace Lutheran Church. It's wonderful to be back here in Ripon after our deployment in Ukraine with the Wisconsin Army National Guard. And I'm excited to be uh, back in the saddle, so to speak, with you uh, virtually or for a few in person. And uh, today is the 15th uh, Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, it is my honor, my privilege, my joy to be with you and to worship uh, the Lord our God. And so we begin with our call to worship. God is with us. We are not alone, abandoned. Christ redeems us. We are surrounded by Christ's love. The Holy Spirit breathes hope and peace into our lives. We are one in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we continue our service with our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, uh, hymn number 858 in our Evangelical Lutheran Worship, verses 1, 2, and 4. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We continue with our prayer of the day. We pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace, replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And our first reading for this morning comes from Genesis chapter 50, beginning at the 15th verse. After Jacob's death, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do me harm, God intended it for good, 
in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 14, beginning at the first verse. This Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here Paul helps us understand that despite differing practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for all of us and will judge each and every one of us. The Apostle Paul writes, Welcome those who are weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them both. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our gospel acclamation. passage is from St. Matthew, chapter 18, beginning at the 21st verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him his debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seized him by the throat. He said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. 
Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. To err is human, to forgive divine. But can we as human beings really achieve the level of the divine? Think of the person who has worked for years at a company, has really tried to earn a promotion, and then somebody who hasn't worked near as long or near as hard, isn't near as smart, gets that promotion because they're a relative or a special friend of the boss. Can that worker who worked so hard and so long participated in professional development, continuing education, education, who really bucked for that promotion. Can that person really rise to the level to forgive the one who undeservedly got that promotion? Or think of the spouse who takes year after year of abuse from the other alcoholic spouse. That alcoholic spouse spends the family's money at the bar or at the liquor store. And there are times the family can't even pay their bills. And then to top it off is abusive to the other spouse. Some would say, citing this verse, well, you have to forgive you have to stay in your marriage. Jesus answered Peter to forgive 77 times. But what of the person who keeps track and then is offended the 78th time? Then is it okay not to forgive? But the Greek could mean 70 times 7, not 77, but 70 times 7, the numbers 7 and 10 being numbers of completeness. So now we're up to 490 times. And really, if we look at the meaning of what Jesus said, again, 7 and 10 being numbers of completeness or wholeness means to always forgive, whether it be 77 or 490 it really means to constantly, continually forgive. Should that spouse who is being abused, who is living in such a hard relationship, a hard marriage, forgive continuously and stay with that person, that abuser, till death do them part? Or what about on a national scale, rising from an individual uh, setting to a national setting? What if a country is attacked? How should the national leadership react? Very soon we'll come to the 19th anniversary of the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City, September 11th, 2001. We as a country were attacked by malevolent forces. Are we to hold our national leaders, our president, our Congress, to the standards that Jesus sets to forgive continuously? In the face of an attack where thousands of Americans were killed and injured, our economy harmed, are we simply to say, we as a nation forgive you, those of you who are in Al-Qaeda, How are we supposed to forgive? That's really the gist of the verse here. 
We want to be faithful Christians. We want to follow in Jesus' path. And part of that path, as we read from today's gospel passage, is to be forgiving people. But what does that really mean? Well, first of all, we need to understand that sometimes we need to look at ourselves when we're pondering how we forgive others. We need to understand that no matter how we judge others, we too are sinful people. One of the things that this verse is, or this passage is talking about, is human nature. And we know going all the way back to Genesis that if we're going to be true to ourselves, if we're going to be humble, if we're going to be honest, we too are sinful people. It's always easier to point the finger at the other to find blame, to find the cause or the reason for the problem or the unhappiness. But the first step that we need to take is to understand that we too are sinful by nature. We have regrets. We've made mistakes. We've gone off the path. We've caused harm to others. And when we realize this, admit this in humbleness and in faith, then it's easier for us to try and walk in that other person's shoes and to ask ourselves, why is this person acting the way they are? Why has that person acted in a way that I perceive has harmed me, has offended me? And then we can go to that person, we can talk with that person, and out of love, out of humbleness, and yes, out of strength, we can try and resolve the issue to stop whatever offending behavior is going on. In today's parable, Jesus talks about this slave that owes the king a huge amount of money. Jesus says that this slave owes 10,000 talents. It is a measure of wealth, a measure of money that is immense. In today's uh, standard, it would be over 200 tons of silver. In order to pay off 10,000 talents back in Jesus' day, the average laborer would have to work 150,000 years and take all of his or her earnings and pay it to the king. Obviously, an impossible task. What Jesus is saying is that there is no way on this earth that this slave can pay off that debt. Who is this slave? It's you and me. And Jesus is making the point that once again, because of our nature, there is no way that we can measure up to the righteousness, to the perfection of God. And yet, in order for us to have a relationship with God, there cannot be sin within that relationship. God, being perfect, cannot co-mingle with sin. And so what Jesus is saying to us is that we cannot do this on our own. Whether it's forgiving ourselves, whether it's forgiving somebody else, whether it is being in relationship with God, on our own, we can't do it. Now, to the average person, this may sound very strange. Why would God make creation make us this way? It doesn't sound fair. God makes us this way. We have, going back to Adam, chosen sin over righteousness. Therefore, we can't have a relationship with God as God intends. If we can't do it, how can God expect it? It just doesn't seem fair. But what God is saying 
is human beings. I am the author of all that is. And even though you value your independence, even though you want to go your own way, beloved brothers and sisters, you need me. I am the author of life. I'm the author of all that is. I love you. I want to be in relationship with you. And sometimes we need to be humbled in order to understand who is the Lord our God. The temptation is to say, I'm God. I can make my own decisions. I'm a grown man. I'm mature. I've got life figured out. I don't need some God telling me what to do and how to do it. But once again, if we're really honest, if we're humble, if we take a look at the reality of our lives and of our world, oh yes, we really do need God to forgive us, to make us clean. That's one of the central tenets of the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross, taking all of our sins upon him to make us clean in God the Father's sight. It's a wonderful, renewing, regenerating, generous message. The Christian message is not one of, you're not good enough. The message is, God made you, and everything that God made is good. Because you are so good, God gave his one and only Son for you, even to die on the cross to take away your and my sins. And that is the story, the moral of the parable. There's no way that slave could work 150,000 years to pay off those 10,000 talents. Only the king could forgive that debt. Once again, you and I are that slave. That slave, being human, was prone to error, prone to sin. And so what did he do in the parable? After being forgiven that huge debt, he goes out and finds another slave which owed him 100 denarii or 100 days wages, just a tiny fraction of what he himself had owed to the king, seizes him by the throat and says, pay me, pay me my debt back. And that second slave says, I'll do it. Give me some time and I'll do it. But the, the first slave, forgetting or ignoring that he'd been forgiven a much larger debt, said, no. I am throwing you into debtor's prison until you and presumably your family will work hard enough to pay me off. I am not forgiving your debt. What a picture of our human nature. Forgetting our own sinfulness, yet pointing our fingers at others and saying, look how sinful you are. Look how sinful you are. And what Jesus is saying is remember who you are. Sinful by nature. Yes, you've made mistakes too. But also remember who Jesus is, the one who forgave your debt, who forgives your sins, past, present, and future, so that you may have a second chance every day, so that your life may be renewed, so that you can start afresh, and so that your sins can be viewed not through the windshield, but through the rear view mirror. And so that slave that threw the second slave into debtor's prison until the debt should be paid, 
he then had consequences to pay also. And this again speaks to our nature. Even modern psychology speaks to this. When we forgive another, yes, the other may benefit, but who benefits more? Modern psychology, the science of psychology, will tell us, does tell us, that when we hold a grudge, when we will not forgive, it hurts me, it hurts you more than it does the one whom we perceive has offended us. When we hold on to that grudge so tight that bitterness goes right to the bone. That's a way of saying that there are physical and mental and spiritual consequences when we in our bitterness we, in our judgment, hold a grudge and refuse to forgive another. And so when Jesus, in today's parable, is telling us to forgive, it is not just to reflect the divine, but it is for our own good too, more than for the other person's good. So out of love, out of faith, we're called to do the difficult. To forgive those who have offended us and maybe continue to offend us. It's a high calling. Nobody said that Christianity would be convenient or easy. But it's a calling nonetheless. It's what we're charged to do. But before I go any further, let's talk just a bit about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not allowing the offender to continue offending us or harming us. It's not accepting things the way they are, even though day after day we're being harmed, either spiritually, mentally, or physically. Jesus is not saying to allow that harm to go on unchallenged. We're not the only ones who are held to a Christian standard. Those who are offending, those who are the offenders, are held to the same standard. To love their neighbors, meaning everybody around them, as they love themselves. So forgiveness does not mean to allow yourself to be a rug which people can walk all over. God empowers you to stand up for your own dignity, for your own well-being, for your own righteousness. To call a sin a sin just as Jesus did many times in the Gospels. And you being empowered, part of forgiveness can be, should be, to call a sin a sin. And do what you need to do with the help of the church, with the help of family, with the help of friends, to make the wrong right. And if the other person refuses to cooperate, to look at other alternatives for your life. Here again, the church is here as a resource for you. And so as we go through our lives, each of us, because of the imperfection of our world, experiencing those offenses, experiencing hurt from others and from situations, and yes, doing that ourselves to others. We look to Jesus as our exemplar. We look to Jesus as the one who forgives, the one who sets a holy standard for us. And in prayer, in conversation with other faithful people, we do our best to walk on Jesus' path.
That path that he shows us, a path that includes forgiveness, forgiveness for ourselves, forgiveness for others, and in community with the church, in community with God's people, doing our best to figure things out so that we can live the lives as God intends. Lives full of purpose, lives full of joy, lives full of community and companionship, healthy with others, lives of service to others, lives of faith. And so as we ponder these things, as we ponder today's reading, we can remember, yes, to err is human, both other people and ourselves. And to forgive is not only divine, but it is possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Our sermon hymn of the day is On My Heart, Imprint Your Image, hymn 811 in our Evangelical Lutheran Worship. Christian Church, we confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people. We pray. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith, O Lord. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen our faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes, and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
And now we pray as Jesus teaches all his disciples, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God, the creator of all things, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, Holy Spirit, living voice, calling and enlightening the church, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending him, ye watchers, on the Holy Ones, that's uh, hymn 424 out of Evangelical Lutheran Worship, verses 1 and 4. Peace, sound the good news. Thanks be to God.